187 countries across the world who participate each year in observing 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. A warm welcome to you all who are here and those who will join. I hope that at the end of this forum, you'll be more informed, more aware, and that you would have identified ways that you can add your voice to the call for an end to gender-based violence. As we explore the subject, intimacy, marriage, and gender-based violence, our response. We welcome our esteemed panelists, Mrs. Altia Leng, fashion model, educator, and CEO of Corporate Image, Reverend Oliver Daly, Minister of Religion and Family Counselor, Mrs. Joy Crawford, co-founder e for life and Dr. Peter Ann Baker, social worker and social development practitioner. Today, we'll be hearing their voices as they share their stories and perspectives and give suggestions and resolutions to stem the spread of this pandemic of gender-based violence. To invite God's presence, we ask Reverend Hilda Vaughan, curate at the Mandeville Parish Church, to lead us in prayer. Reverend Vaughan. Let us pray. Lord of justice and mercy, we thank you for this opportunity of sharing Draw us into your kingdom. Lengthen our stride to march for good, to trample the works of unrighteousness. Enable us with insight to recognize violence in all its forms and courage to speak up for justice. Give us compassion for the vulnerable and grace to stand with them sharing the strength of Jesus. Empower us as we listen, that we may with prayerful hearts breathe peace, transforming the world, speaking your eternal wisdom, living your word, abiding in your spirit, now and always. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 I've been looking in the chat and I see that we have some very notable participants this afternoon, this evening, and I would like to give a special welcome to our diocesan president of the Mothers Union in Jamaica, Mrs. Spencer Jarrett. Also, other, other members of the executive and the Mothers Union members in Jamaica and across the world who are here joining with us and their friends and family. This evening, we chose to focus on the victims of physical, sexual, and psychological violence within the context of intimate partner relationships and marriage. Each day, we are bombarded with gruesome stories of domestic abuse, stabbings, and shootings, leading at times to death in relationships that started with partners who were starry-eyed and so in love. As Barry Hammond says, how can you hurt the one you love? This evening, we seek answers to questions such as what has gone wrong? What are the causes? How does society's perception of gender role help perpetuate gender-based violence? What are the power relationships involved? Is gender-based violence more prevalent among certain sectors of society? Does marriage legitimize rape and gender-based violence? Do religious traditions help sanction violence against women? And why do women or men who are verbally, sexually, and physically abused by their partners go back to them? What should be the church's response? And more importantly, what is our role to help stem the spread of gender-based violence. To begin the dialogue, I'd like to invite Ms. Rubian Forbes to introduce our first panelist, Ms. Joy Crawford. Ms. Rubian Forbes. Good evening, everyone. 
Joy Lovelet Crawford, a registered general nurse by training, is co-founder and the director of programs and a training at Eve for Life. Mrs. Crawford's work experience spans 30 years in areas such as program project management, HIV program development and implementation, trainer, coach, counselor, and facilitator. He also specialized in the management of primary health care services, adolescent sexual and reproductive programming, and general nursing with special emphasis on mental well-being. She has developed and co-authored several training manuals on adolescent reproductive health, HIV, and AIDS and parenting, one of which is Positive Parenting, Bridging the Gap, which was published in August 2006. She's married and is the mother of two children and co-parent of two others. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite Mrs. Lovelet Crawford to make her presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Forbes. Um, I, I wish we didn't have to do those bio things um, <laughs> sometimes, but uh, good evening, colleagues, friends. I want to thank you for having me on this conversation. Um, over the last two hours, I've been agonizing about how did I end up here <laughs> and what do I say? Um, the person who introduced us tonight said so many, asked so many questions and all of those questions are relevant. But I want to start at the last one about what should we do? Mm -hmm. um, I want to encourage us as we have a conversation that every time I think about gender-based violence and HIV and all the things that go with it, marital rape and all the discussions that we've been having and advocating for, the role of faith-based church mm -hmm. religion has always been a pet peeve of mine. Mm -hmm. um, because one, I have such high expectation and two, there has been so much disappointment. Mm -hmm. And so as we listen this evening, I would not want us to leave here as practitioners without remembering something. I always think about the call in Jeremiah that call for acts, is there no balm in Gilead? Mm -hmm. And is there no physician there? And that question has remained unanswered in my over 20 years of working directly with women and girls and families impacted by GBV. And in particular, when it comes to the church, there are so many stories that I could tell one of the main thing I will say is in 20, 2008, myself and Patricia Watson co-founded an NGO in Jamaica to respond to the plight of women and girls who were being left behind in the national HIV response. And very early into our work, we had focus group discussions. And one of the conversation that motivates and drove our work was having a woman should have been about in her early 50s in a session. She's HIV positive. And we're doing this workshop about what it means to live with HIV and take your medication and all that kind of thing, giving them hope. And as I came to the end of it, I asked her what was one thing that she thought was extremely difficult for her as a woman living with HIV. And she shared with us that her problem was not dying from HIV her problem was dying a liar. And it struck me and I was like, what are you saying? She says, I'm a Christian, mm -hmm. I'm a woman of faith. Mm -hmm. And since I got my diagnosis of HIV, I have had to start lying mm -hmm. about my status because I don't want anybody to know. Oh, and she God. says, I've lied about it for so long that I now lie about everything else. Mm -hmm. 
and one lie has added to another lie. And it really, it literally broke my heart. It has never left me. And she went on to share that when her congregation found out about her status, she hadn't told anybody. She had not told her pastor. But, you know, the word got around. She used to be a part of a woman's movement. They didn't call it um, the issue around Mother's Union at the time. She was in another um, phase. She says one of her role was to do the refreshment. Mm -hmm. And every time they would have outreach, visiting the sick and hospital and so, she used to cook. <laughs> and then she was removed from those jobs, from those roles of service. And one duty or role kept being removed. Sister, we didn't need you for this today. Or the events would happen on days that she weren't aware. And it really crushed her. And she said that level of rejection from her faith community mm -hmm. and the fact that she is now living a lie was more painful than the diagnosis of living with HIV. I have never forgotten it. And it's something I share every time when I get a chance to speak to people of faith. I appeal to you, do not underestimate how much we need you in this response to do the empathy and the love and all that is required for people when they're hurting usually would want to reach out to some God presence. And if not us, then who? Mm -hmm. I want to make two quick points as I close my presentation, my opening presentation. Gender-based violence is really about power. I want us to clarify that there are four main types or manifestation of gender-based violence that we have in our books. That's physical violence, sexual violence, emotional or mental violence, and economic violence. Of course, the physical one is very obvious. You can see the bruises. The sexual ones, we understand quite clearly. But the issue around emotional violence and economic violence, I hope we can unpack those later. Mm -hmm. How does this impact within the faith space? Gender-based violence is in three, it, the root is three things. One, a breach of human rights. It is my right as a female to have an opinion. It is my right as a female to want to do and know what is to be done to my body. It is my right, a human rights, to participate in any decision that is being made on my behalf. So when I hear things like the, girl, the woman talk back, she disrespectful, you know, she said no. All of those things are a breach of my right to be. The second piece of it is inequality a gender inequality and this is cultural not just cultural now i want us to even after today to look at it there's so much work that is done about gender in the church it's all over great work that has been done by different faith spaces but one that i remember quite clearly is the issue of the woman who was caught in adultery and who was brought so to jesus to be stoned and i keep asking myself who she was having an affair with where was the man, even though in my understanding of the Jewish law, and I'm by no way clergy, I know clergy is here, the law said anyone that was caught in adultery was supposed to receive that, which means the man and the woman. But for some reason, even that story, there's no mention of the male who was a part of that re relationship. So every time we grapple with the issue, of gender and gender inequality, we must look as a faith community. Where do we see it showing up? How do we participate or continue to facilitate that gender equality in how we carry out our work and our practice? The last piece of it I want to say is about the sexual violence piece of it. Now, you know, we know for some faith spaces, I hear that the word sex is taboo, but I hear Hilda told me that in this space, 
it was allowed. But the issue around rape and incest and those things and HIV really is being fueled in Jamaica primarily through sex. Yes, we understand the issue around mother to child transmission and those things, but within our context, especially in the region, is sexual contact. And then I go back to the issue of how we as a faith community don't deal with the issue of sexual sins. There are over 10 or 12 incidents and could be more of incest in the Bible. I've never gone to any church service and hear any pastor preach about incest. They may have, I don't know, Reverend Daly or anybody, but I've, I've just not heard it. We preach about many things. I've not heard us speak enough about what we have seen recently in the last years of the amount of mem ministers of religion who have been charged. We have not, as a community, spoken about it. If we did, we did it within our own safe spaces. But I definitely haven't heard enough condemnation or saying we disassociate with in the, in the mass. So I am very concerned and I'm very grateful that we're having this conversation. And I'm hoping that when we are done tonight, some of these issues will become more magnified that everybody on this call and who is listening will realize that we are the bomb of Gilead. And if not us, then who? Thank you very much. <laughs> Mrs. Crawford, <laughs> that was intense. You started on the right note. You put responsibility where it needs to be with the church. You need not to ostracize, ostracize rather, but to show empathy and love. We need as a church to speak up, speak about those sexual sins. We thank you. And we will continue to ponder what you're saying as we listen to the other presenters. And I hope that those who are here representing the church and even not those who are not representing the church would have left, even if they're here, no one else, with something from your presentation to make a difference. Thank you. Thanks. And I invite Ms. Norm, Mrs. Norma Ricketts introduce our next presenter, Alice Altier Ling. <laughs> um, I'm about to lost for words, Miss Crawford. Miss Ling. I always tell them, don't let me go first, Altier. Right. <laughs> no, let us have Miss Rickies. Miss Rickies is going to introduce the lovely Altier Ling. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real pleasure of mine to introduce our second presenter. She's a woman of many hats, a mother, a teacher, a fashion model, insurance executive, public relations manager, grooming, personality development and image consultant, businesswoman, and we could just say she is multi-talented. Her career spans decades and she has achieved many firsts. She won the Miss Jamaica Fashion Model Pageant in 1985. And this launched her into her modeling career. She was a phenomenon in New York because of her lips and she still has them. <laughs> she captivated passers-by, photographers, and became the front page or cover page model for various magazines. Essence Magazine at the age of 30, Chick, Magazine of London in 1987, Essence Magazine, 1990, 
and a number of other magazines. She has been cover page and pages inside. She returned to Jamaica because of her love for family and the country. This multi-talented lady decided that she was going to help to develop Jamaican women and also to improve the image of Jamaican men. With her reservoir of experience and talent, she recently established the Althea Lang Image Consultancy, a training and consulting firm offering personal development to teens, tweens, business executives. She has been a real source for schools, helping in the training of students and teachers. And the most, most recently to the Attorney General's Chamber, she has assisted in training. Ms. Leng graduated from Hampton High School. She went to Excelsior UWI, where she did the teacher training. She had personal management development at gym. But she continues always to be learning and passing on her knowledge of grooming, preparing Jamaican women for the world. Most recently, in 2019 and 2020, she was included in the 60th edition of the Gleaner Company book, honoring 60 exemplary Jamaican women, and was also awarded the RJR Gleaner Company Award for Women of Distinction. She has recently been recognized in the May June 2020 issue of Essence Magazine as a black woman fashion icon of the 90s. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce Miss Althea Lenn, one of Jamaica's outstanding daughters one of our presenters this evening. I ask you all to join me in welcoming Miss Lang. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can, you. you can give her a hand, give her a hand, please. Give her an elbow. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Um, I thank you very much. And Mrs. Ricketts and I go a very long way. Her daughter and I have been friends forever. So this whole relationship too has stood um, the test of time. Interestingly, am I am I getting a there? Thank you. You're fine. There is somebody, there's something happening there. Oh, you should move their mics. There's talking in the background. All right, that sounds better. All right, thank you so much for the accolades, Mrs. Ricketts. And all of that that you're hearing came after I to my experience of being an abused wife. Um, I think I have healed over the years, but for me, I thought that only women from a certain socioeconomic strata could experience any kind of gender violence. Married in the Anglican church, confirmed Anglican, and from a family where my parents had an exemplary marriage and I was swept off my feet by my knight in, in right in armor, shining armor, who swept me off my feet. 
when I look back at my life, I realize that as women in the Jamaican society, as women from the middle class society, having gone to a school where I was sheltered, I was never exposed to relationships. The only relationships we knew of was Monroe boys and writing love letters and getting chocolates. So when you get into the real world and somebody is interested in you, you believe, oh my God, this is it, this is it. Um, this is the man for me. And then you enter that marriage. You enter that marriage and for the first year, everything is absolutely beautiful. But when you get married at 21, what happens is that you have no understanding of who you are. Having come from a sheltered environment, again, I say that. And my father actually told my husband that he was giving him a bite dog, but he wasn't giving him a muzzle because my father knew that I was a very determined person. I had my own personality. And eventually my husband wouldn't realize that, listen, this is not an easy nut to crack. But I was taught that one ought to be submissive. I grew up in a household where my mother took on the role of being that submissive person. But I never saw my father abuse my mother. I never heard him abuse her in any way. I actually came into my own at about 22 and that's when all the problems started. Um, my husband dictated that I stay at home. I raised my child. He dictated what I wore. He dictated who my friends ought to be. And I did not respond negatively. I thought that was what marriage was about, right? Being the perfect wife and being submissive. But as the years went on, there was this burning desire to be and to become the woman that I thought that I was placed on this earth to be. And then the abuse started. I did not realize that I was married to somebody who was a narcissist. He wanted to control my money. I had to give him my check at the end of every month. He controlled, as I said, my friends. I was not allowed to go out. I did not have a social life at all. And then the greatest part of it was that my, we were doing things, trying to build life economically. And then we started a pharmacy. The lady who came to work in my pharmacy was a pastor's wife. And I'm sharing this with you this evening. This pastor's wife ended up being involved in a relationship with my husband, getting pregnant for my husband, and eventually having a child for my husband. That shattered my world because when I spoke about it, this is when the physical abuse start, started, the emotional abuse, the verbal abuse, the torment, and my only escape was agri -ions. When I went to Agri for a session, my, Agri called my husband. My husband told Agri that I'm a mad woman and he's not coming down to speak with him because Agri wanted to see how best we could work it out. I had to deal with embarrassment from everybody knowing that he was involved with this woman, that this woman was the pastor's wife. And I thought about it real hard. And I decided that this is not what I want for me. And a lot of women who linger in these relationships have to understand, there's nothing that you can tell them. They have to come to the realization that this is the time for them to move on. When I decided to move on, it was one Sunday morning, I decided I had enough. I didn't know where I was going. I knew I could not go home because my mother and father really liked my husband. My aunts and uncles, they thought he was a perfect person for me because he had two different sides. He was Jack, um, Hyde, Jekyll and Hyde. And um, so when I decided to leave that Sunday morning, what he did, because he didn't want the neighbors to know that I was leaving, he actually threw everything out over the balcony, onto the ground, panties, everything, and I just put them in my car and I drove away. I didn't know where I was going. But listen to me, when you leave everything in the hands of God, he finds a way. 
I thought I was on the verge. I was in that dark place. And I jumped in that car and I drove to the grill. I had enough money to stay in a hotel for maybe two days until Monday when I would go to the bank and get some money. And I was on the beach and I was there, I was there crying. And this gentleman came up to me, my angel, because God sends your angels in your deepest, darkest trials. And I started sharing everything with, with, me, with him. He was Hugh Maitland Walker and he was a manager of Shop at Beach Hotel. And I just opened up to this gentleman, a total stranger. I told him everything I was going through. And he said to me, Althea, go back to Kingston, get the rest of your stuff. I am going to create a position for you at Shop at Beach Hotel. That position included a flat, rent-free, food in my fridge, rent-free, access to the hotel accommodation, one grand vacation that I had not had in years. And I moved into the Shaw Park Hotel. However, the Monday morning when I went to the bank to get some money to do some stuff, all the money was drawn out of the account because he was a banker. But that was, having gone through that, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because if that did not happen, I would not become the woman that I am today. And I, my, I took my limes and I made lemonade and proceeded to move on with the strength that I knew that I got from inside and the fact that I knew God was preserving me for a reason. And then I moved on to Shaw Park Beach Hotel. After Shaw Park Beach Hotel, then came the competition. Then I decided to enter the competition and I won and the rest was history. Now, there are so many women who want to remain in a space because of the fact that they're living comfortably. They're driving a nice car and they lose themselves in these relationships because some of us women believe that we can't do without a man. I have been single for over 25 years and I'm loving it because I've fallen in love with me. It has been a journey. I have raised my grandchildren through all of that. And I have poured into their, their souls. But at the same time, I have become the woman that I want to be. And to be honest with you, um, I don't know what Pastor Day, Reverend Day is going to say, but the next man who's going to come into my life, the Lord is going to have to put him in front of me and say, this is the person for you. But in the meanwhile, what I plan to do and what I've been doing is sharing. There are women that I know in Kingston. Persons have called me and said, listen, you need to talk to this woman because she's going through stuff and some of them are suicidal and some blah, blah, blah. And it's so important that they understand that they have to start loving themselves first. And few of us as women understand the importance of loving themselves. Um, when it is all said and done, um, <clears throat> the lady who caused me pain, she went back to her husband, she had another child, and she's living happily ever after. I have prayed about it and I've asked the Lord to forgive me because had that situation not occurred, and if I had not used that in a um, situation and turned it into all a positive way, I would not, as I said, become the woman that I am today. I give God thanks. I give God thanks for the persons who have supported me along the way. I give thanks for my mother's prayers because she is a staunch Mother's Union member. She's 94. She's my best friend. And um, she just keeps praying for me. And I ask everybody who is online, there are so many women like myself um, who needs to understand that when you go to the church sometimes to share, their answer is that you are married and you have to make it work. But it's not all the time that the marriage can work, especially if you're unequally yoked because of the fact that I was not allowed to go to church and it was crazy. So um, I honestly believe that whatever I can do, however I can work with the Anglican community or any other community, E for Life, whatever it is, to see how much I can do to bring hope to another woman who has been hurting because it's not easy. And 
a lot of us are afraid of reaching out to a psychiatrist or a psychologist because we want persons might say, Lord, she mad or she not right in our head or whatever it is. But if you need to reach out to someone who you want to share with, non somebody who's going to be non-judgmental, you need to access the services that are available in terms of our psychiatrists and the psychologists on this island. And I thank God that I am here, I am whole, and I do not need anybody to validate me because the years have taught me that the best is still yet to come. And at 65, who knows, I might ask Pastor Daly to, to marry me soon. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, but th that's my story. And, and it's something that we need to understand that it, life is very precious and nobody needs to sit in a situation that is hopeless because we as women, we are in charge of our lives and we need to ensure that we become the woman that we ought to be. That's a synopsis. Mm. Thanks for sharing, Miss Altia Leng, Mrs. Altia Leng. You use limes to make lemonade. You have come from being a young, middle-class, abused, most emotionally and physically wife to an accomplished, world-class fashion model, etc., etc., etc. And you have brought to the fore the role that the church plays. On the one hand, you were taught that, you know, you're married, you should make it work. You're a wife, you should be submissive. But you made that right choice at the right time and with God, you were able to turn your whole life around. Thank you for your courage and your strength. And thank you that you are using that to empower others. It's so profound this afternoon, this evening, we are just all, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> I don't know what else is to come. But at this time, I'd like to invite Alison Moody to introduce Dr. Peter Ann Baker. Ms. Moody, Ms. Nichols, Mrs. Nichols. Hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you now. Okay, great. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Ann Baker. Dr. Peter Ann Baker is a member of St. Jude in Stony Hill. She has extensive involvement in ecumenical movement at national, regional, and international levels. Peter Ann is a trained social worker. She, work, she worked in several fields in NGO sector, including human rights and rural community development. She spent almost 25 years teaching social work at the University of the West Indies, from which she retired at the level of senior lecturer. Peter Ann is particularly interested in contemplative practice, human rights, especially as they pertain to gender, aging, and persons with disability. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Peter Ann Baker. Evening, everybody. Good evening, Dr. I know, Baker. I know this process here doesn't work well. Um, that's the one thing because we, we can't do the eye contact and, the, and, and those kinds of things. But I am certainly very, very happy that um, the St. Mark's Mother's Union decided to put on this, this panel. Um, the rare occurrence, there are some other people online who can probably tell me if there's been one in recent times. I don't remember such. Um, I want to start, um, especially in a way, pick up from both Joy and Althea. Joy's disappointment with the church um, and I, I always encourage people to say the churches and the congregations because um, that is what is failing us. 
and failing women in particular who are in that situation. Um, and I want to, to, to pick up on, on Althea's comment about you know, the, the, what, what women are taught, especially women who are in, in, in marriages and so on. But first I want to just um, very quickly do some clarifications because I know not everyone who may be online um, and, and I must share with you, I'm a little um, concerned that this period, these 16 days of activism have become to, to end gender-based violence. And let me tell you why. Gender-based violence is about women and men. And men do um, experience the violence of the type that Joy outlined, the physical, the sexual, um, the emotional, and the economic violence. Um, also, men and women in same-sex relationships also experience those kinds of violence. But there are, there are ways in which men in particular, there are, there are expressions of violence, forms of violence that men experience, which I am yet to hear um, men take on as serious conversations. So I'm, I'm concerned because this period really is about violence against women. And it's violence against women because they are women. And because the society tells us that quote unquote, women behave in certain ways. And if, if we don't behave in those ways, then we make ourselves liable to be punished, to be corrected. So I think it's really important to, to keep talking about violence against women, in addition to gender-based violence, which looks at the, the experiences of both women and men and the reasons why men also experience violence. And then of course you have the broad thing of domestic violence. And just to let you know that the police have a very broad definition of domestic violence. So if you're going to them about a man and woman issue, um, you know, you may or may not get hurt, but also if there's an issue that you get into a fight with your sister in, in, in your front yard, that's also domestic violence. Um, I thought it was an interesting um, definition. And then there's intimate partner violence, which is part, I think, the focus of our conversations today, because um, if you're on social media, for example, you will see the many, many ways that women experience, especially emotional violence, sometimes physical violence, just walking on the street. You know, we call it harassment, but in some instances, it is more terrifying than, than straight up harassment, which you may think, okay, I can brush this off. But if in fact the ha harassment persists um, from the same person or from a range of people, you have to, to go to work or you have to go to school. And every time you, this group of men working on a site or a security guard and so on, has reason to, to speak to you in a way which is improper, which assumes that you should receive his comments. That is also a form of violence. And I know of women who are increasingly reducing this, the scope of their movement. I mean, that, that kind of harassment is more su successful at getting some women to stay at home than COVID protocols. So I think it's, it's the, there's a lot for us to talk about and that's why I want to really focus on the kinds of violence that we experience from persons who are close to, to us, persons to whom we have an emotional connection um, and very often persons with whom we have um, a sexual relationship, because that's, that's just one part. So that I, just, I thought I would kind of want to say, this is a huge issue, even just the intimate pa partner violence is a big issue. And this part of a much larger whole. The other thing I want to, I want to, to touch on um, three things, three challenges, let me call them that. Um, and the first challenge, the first and second are really related to each other. So that, 
you, you have large numbers of people, including large numbers of women, who, if they talk about being physically abused, sexually abused, even having their money taken away or being told that them stupid, um, you know, persistently, are going to say, what did she do to deserve it? So we have some, we have some attitudes in the community which make it hard for women who are experiencing those things to seek help and to seek support. When you look at it in the context of the churches, you have an additional layer. Because remember, you know, all the members of congregations are part of the same society. Mm -hmm. So they reflect, they hold many of the attitudes that we hear on the street. Let's not, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that because they, they call themselves religious persons that those cultural attitudes and perspectives um, have been erased. The, the other issue in the church, and, and Oliver can tell me, I, I see it more as a doctrinal issue, but it is based on, on theology. And, and that is because those, in, those who are Christian and also those even I know members of Islam and, and certainly um, you know, people of the Jewish faith, the, the man has been centered. In, in those religions. Um, I'm not going to get into the theological debates about whether that is quote unquote right, how it came about. But one of the things that I know in my approach to scripture and, and to faith is to, is to put things in their historical and cultural context, because I think those things are really important. Um, but the church, especially if you are a married woman, the church is of very little help. Let us be absolutely frank. And that is both persons in the queue, in the pew, members of mother's union, um, clergy persons, some of them are of very little help, both in terms of being receptive to your story and then the other dimension, which is one of the things that prevents women from coming forward, the other dimension will treat your concerns in confidence and also will not try to move to reconciliation. Come, let us try and see if, you know, let, let me call your husband and, you know, let, let me sit down and talk to him about it. I have a, I have a saying. Um, you can't have reconciliation without justice. Justice must come before reconciliation. Okay, this is not about forgiveness. Forgiveness is in your hands. But to be reconciled and the nature of the reconciliation doesn't mean I'm going to go back into the house to live with this man. And justice may mean that he has to find somewhere else to live because part of the inequity is that very often it is the woman who has to get up and find somewhere to go, especially and including the times. And that's one of the things that makes women stay, especially if they have children to care for. And they think about where am I going to go with these children? So there, there, there are several dimensions of both the way the, the, the faith communities and the way in which they interpret their faith, the way in which they, they promote certain kinds of ideas, which, which you will find particularly when you take very literal approaches to scripture. And it's one of the areas that I find amusing. I, I always say Jamaicans love the Old Testament much more than they love the New Testament. So, so the, the, the violence and so on, are, those things are all you know, theologies of domination that keep you down. So the, there, and one last thing, and that's not related to cultural or social or church, that is related to the fact that the resources for persons who experience violence, intimate partner violence are dreadfully, woefully inadequate. E for life, Women's Incorporated, which has operated a shelter for about, I think, 
uh, at least 20 years, which is a non-government organization, the government of Jamaica, only this year, a month ago, declared the opening of a government funded shelter for women who have experienced abuse. We are yet to see how it will operate because it's, it can't take in everybody. So I want to just touch on those things. So my thing, so what do we do? Because this is, a, this is like when you talk about climate change or one of those kinds of things, it's so huge, you have no idea where to start. And I, I would like to make a, a, the suggestion that we start very small, that we don't stick to denominational boundaries but that we begin to identify women in the churches who have lent a shoulder, who are concerned about these issues and who are willing to, 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 to be at the other end of a phone when the phone calls come. I'll say, you say, you, you know, you have friends who call you because they know, but we need to begin to build up a cadre of women within the church because many of these women are not going to go to external agencies. And we need to do that. And then I also believe that the women's organizations in the churches, all the churches have women's organizations, need to start going to convention, going to synod and so on, and putting forward resolutions, whatever proposals, organizing workshops around these questions. Because if we don't begin ourselves within our own houses to address this issue, we will continue to disappoint those of our household and those who are not of our household. I'm done. <laughs> Dr. Baker, you have been very frank and honest and open in your discussion. And you broadened our understanding of gender-based violence to include not just violence against women and girls, but those that are against men and those men in same-sex relationships. And that's for another forum that the church probably needs to have. You have also looked at the societal attitudes that, you know, the blame game that when women, the woman gets abused, it's always, what did she do? and the theological basis of being, the man being dominant as one of the causes, can we say, of gender-based violence. But you have left us with food for thought. And I'm sure out of this discussion, right here in this discussion, in this discussion we have women here from the Mother's Union. We have Miss Leng here, we have others here connected to the church who are willing to work with the church, who can be that listening ear, who can help speak up and speak out, as you said, at Synod and in other forum. So I wanna thank you. Thank you for your input this afternoon. And we're gonna move right along to our minister in the midst, Reverend Oliver Daly and ask Miss Raquel Walters to introduce, sorry, I'm Miss Novlin Ricketts to introduce Reverend Daly. Daly. Miss Novlin? She's muted. Miss Novlin? She needs to unmute. She has not mute, unmuted her mic. Oh, are you hearing me? I'm sorry for that. I'll go again. Reverend J. Oliver Daly, it is my pleasure to introduce him to you all. He's a son of Hannibal. He was educated at Rossi High School and the United Theological College of the West Indies a minister of the United Church in the Cayman Islands. He was ordained in 1969. He served as a pastor 
at the Meadowbrook United Church from 1969 to 1978. At the Webster United Church from 1978 to 1999. And at the Richmond United Church from 1999 to 2016. He is now retired. Prior to his retirement from the ministry, he served twice as moderator of the United Church in Jamaica, the Cayman Islands, president of the Jamaica Council of Churches, and as a radio family counselor, an RGR from 1980 to 2007. He served on several boards and organizations in the past. These include the Manual Ministers Fraternal, Knox College, the National Housing Trust, Land Divestment Committee, Tourism Enhancement Fund, National Solid Waste Management Committee, Canadian Farm Workers Program, National Family Planning Board, the Social Development Commission, Values and Attitudes Advisory Committee, Jamaica Daily News, Horizon Group, United Theological College, Jamaica Council of Churches, and St. Andrew High School for Girls. In 2001, he was awarded the Order of Distinction Commander Class for service in the field of religion. He was also awarded the Jamaica Council of Churches Award for Service in Ecumenical Movement, the Silver Musgrave Award in Religion and Art. He is married and the father of five children. His interests, as he sings, plays the guitar, an avid cricket fan, art enthusiast, especially music, and the theater. It is my pleasure to, well, to present to you our presenter for this evening, the Reverend Oliver Daly. <laughs> well, that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I find it a very moving experience to be part of this engagement this evening. And I find it very, very meaningful to be privileged to be reflecting on this occasion, on this very important issue, intimacy, marriage, gender-based violence or response. And I have heard quite a bit of mention about the church and quite rightly so, about religion, and quite rightly so. So in relation to my remarks, I would want to first make an observation. Um, nowhere in any of the four gospels, I just want to make an observation about Jesus and the radical approach he took to this, to, to this matter. As I, as I want to put it, where well, Jesus lived in a male-dominated, um, matri patriarchal society, uh, position, privilege, power, were, were, were all about men. And the consequence of the use of that was that women were made to feel the way they were made to feel. So, and yet there is, not one woman in the gospel who dissed Jesus. There's not one woman in the gospel who did all the people who dissed Jesus in the gospel were men. Not one woman said anything that was abusive to Jesus. Not one woman said anything that was uncaring, unhelpful. Not one woman said anything that was destructive. Not one woman participated in anything, in any way that was unhelpful to his ministry. 
And I believe that this was so because Jesus in his teachings and his gospel stories and his parables affirmed women. Affirmed women, the most positive relationship in the gospel was between Jesus and the women who were there. He affirmed them, he empowered them, um, so much so that there, there was a woman who went into a party put on by one of the most uh, disrespectful of the type in Jesus' day, um, a Pharisee. And she went in, barged in, and took charge, clasping Jesus' feet, disrupting the event. And Jesus empowered her and praised her and put down the man in, his, in, in, the, whole, in the whole affair. So much so, I'm just saying this because I, I just want to say, I say this all the time in the church and to the churches. Let us pick up the examples of Jesus. See how he puts the matter. In, in Luke's gospel, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, Jesus was, was on a tour. And among the women who were there, hear what the gospel says. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. So the manager of Herod's household, the manager, the wife of one of the ministers of Herod's household had left and was actually financing Jesus's ministry. That same Herod who put down John the Baptist for taking a stance about his treatment of women. So, so I, I'm just wanting to make that point about Jesus and of Jesus and the women in the gospel. And you can go in and out. Joy spoke of one whom Jesus affirmed. He that is without sin throw the first stone at home. One of them actually disrupted a public teaching session. Jesus was having and said, because she felt so good about how Jesus approached her. He said, blessed is the womb from which, in which you were nurtured and the breast that, 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 that she gave Okay, good. So, like, so I'm just want to say, therefore, I think the church should begin to understand how Jesus approached this matter. And to that extent, because I would now want to say something about how, how we what to do in relation to all of that. Given what Joy said and what the Leng said and what Peter and said, I want to say this to women who, who are being abused. Um, we need to carry this message and in affirming all women and say to them, only the abused can stop an abuser from abusing. Let us carry that, that, that message. Over all these years, when I have engaged with people and mostly I haven't had a situation where it was the man who was being abused, although I'm sure they are. But over all these years, it was the woman. And I keep on saying to the woman, this is my line of engagement. Only you can stop being abused. The, you, the abuser normally cannot stop being an abuser. Only the woman can stop it. So we have to look for ways of helping her to stop it. And um, Mrs. Stalin found a way. And, and I will need to really get this across. So when you talk about reconciliation and forgiveness and all those things, let us fit it into that context. Forgiveness, yes, Peter, and forgiveness is unilateral, but reconciliation is mutual and it has some goals. And yes, the goals are about good relationship and about justice and about healing of memories and about putting shattered lives together again. And it does not necessarily mean that you have to return to the same household, okay? So only women, only the abused rather, can stop the abuser from abusing. So I say to the women, you need to get to that place where you take control of your life because you have lost control to an abuser. And what does taking control mean? 
one, an abuser likes you to keep his secret. He doesn't want you to tell nobody. He wants you to keep what is happening as a secret. Tell somebody, tell the police, tell your family. Scream in the house if he's abusing you. All right? Don't take responsibility for what he is doing to you because he has a way of ridiculing you, demeaning you, neglecting you, and then make you feel that if you had not done what you say they say you have done, he wouldn't have had to do what he did. And so you begin to feel that you are responsible for it. So that's kind of a kind of um, way of treating in a way where he manipulates. Abusers are very, very manipulative. Narcissists. They're manipulative. They, they will do the worst thing to you. They bring you flowers, invite you to dinner, say nice things to you, and make you feel good. And then they come back and do the same thing over and over again. All right? It's a repetitive behavior because it is an addictive behavior. It is addictive behavior. So let me repeat as a response. Help our women to understand that only the abuse can stop an abuser from abusing. Stand your ground. Abusers like for you to keep their secret. Don't make it a secret. Expose it. Don't take responsibility for what's happening. Defend your dignity. Ah. What Jesus did. In all the engagement between Jesus and these women, Jesus defended their dignity, offered solidarity, gave them care, made them feel that their image was, that the God, they were also of God's image. Jesus felt all of that. And notice, some powerful women like the wife of Herod went, left home and went with Jesus because she obviously felt so empowered. And I, and I say this, you know, I say sometimes because Herod was the same one who abused John the Baptist because of what he said to him, to John, that's what John the Baptist said to him. And I sometimes feel that Herod's, that, that, that woman in, in, in the household of Herod felt hurt and wounded by it. John Jesus' ministry and was financing it, so much so. Okay, so maybe I should stop here by saying, therefore, we should empower our women, we should enable our women, we should engage our women in the spirit in which Jesus did it, with the example he did it. That's how the church, in my mind, should undertake the matter, Jesus' example. Um, um, Reverend Daly, um, I find though that a lot of our, I recently did an online workshop with a youth group down in, in Montego Bay, right? On a Friday afternoon session with them. And when I was through with them, one young man actually said that he was so grateful for the workshop because he himself had his inadequacies and he didn't feel he was good enough. And it is very critical that we capture the youth. All when I'm done with persons like me in my 60s who oh, people might consider over the hill. But we have to, the church has to understand that their youth groups, this is where it ought mm -hmm. to begin, in their youth groups where we nurture and we prepare them. So a lot of them won't be making the mistakes that I might have made or others might have made because yes, we went to AYF, but this was not considered important. Mm -hmm. It was not treated that way within the youth groups, it, within the churches. Okay, actually, I, I actually feel that family education of this kind should be a part of our school system. Yes. Yeah, but system. I have for years, we've been saying that and, and nobody seems to, and I don't know, sir, because yes. as a teacher in the system, this is something that they have, they have like workshops, they have like PD workshops, but this approach is not taken. There is, if I may, there is also the HFLE program, but a friend who used to, um, 
facilitates teachers, HFLE teachers said that the major problem in speaking about things like this in school is that the teachers were not comfortable with their own sexuality and in their own skin. So they could not speak to the matter in a clinical way. It, it, and a lot of them she found were, um, sex was a sin. And uh, um, so they had a difficulty with that. But Pat, Pat, um, Pat Phillips had her hand up. I don't know if she wants to come in here. And after Pat, I'd like to refer to something Reverend Daly said. Yes, thanks. Before Pat, I would like to say that we're going to take some questions and feedback, but we ask that you keep it tight because we're trying to keep within the time. The conversation will have to continue and uh -huh. continue and let us go. Pat? Can I go ahead? Can I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay, thank you so much. Just want to affirm the MU for this move and to say that there, there, there is much happening now in different organizations and the church is definitely getting on board. As a member of women's, as a member of women's media watch Jamaica, over the 30 years we've been existing, we have had numerous invitations from various organizations, including the church. The challenge is that the church needs to be moving in this direction now of having it institutionalized. And so the Anglican diocese I know has passed a resolution at Synod um, some time ago so we need to also at, approach it from that angle of, um, of, uh, of ensuring that we follow up and follow through with these resolutions. And um, Oliver, I know over in the United Church as well, right across the board, there yeah. are things happening, but we need to ensure that it becomes institutionalized. So it's not just a one-off workshops. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks for your work, Ms. Phillips. Thanks, and for that Thank information. You. Is there anyone else with a question? Or feedback? Uh, my hand is up. Pottinger. Okay, Miss Pottinger, please go ahead. Hi, Rev D. Hey. Audrey Pottinger here. How you doing? <laughs> Listen, I, I'll try and keep it very brief. So I um, I must thank Dr. Gordon Stair for inviting me because she's a, a faithful Anglican. I'm not an, of the Anglican church. I'm of the United Church. And so I'm really glad that I joined this space and I work a lot with, uh, in terms of ecumenical space. I want to just sort of quickly um, mention that, or just add to the conversation about the need to institutionalize the family life education within the schools. Um, someone mentioned that they teachers are uncomfortable with their sexuality. I also find that many of them have been sexually abused. And so they're just not able to objectively discuss the topic. But I also want to broaden this to say that we also need to, as a church community and within our churches, look at how we bring up our boys mm -hmm. and look at how we bring up our girls. Mm -hmm because we bring up our boys to be the manipulators, yes. to be the narcissists. We bring mm -hmm. up our boys to be insecure. Not, not, this can be inadvertently, but when the mother leaves the boy for migration, that is one of my pet peeves or whatever else it is, then the, when this boy now grows to be a man and latches on to a woman, it's as if he's trying to recreate that sense of security that he didn't get because his mother left. And so we find that that insecurity now leads to the perception that um, the person is, is cheating and the obsessiveness with this person and the need to control and control the money and the sex and everything because they're thinking that they need to do this to keep the, the woman in check. So I think we really need to look at that. We need to look at how we bring up our women because our girls, bring up our girls because our, there's too much out there about the, the, get a man who can provide for you. 
and then they become dependent. And I've done research on intimate partner homicide, suicide. So this is the extreme, not just intimate partner violence. And one of the things that came out is the, the significant age difference mm -hmm. between the men and the women. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are a lot of the old, the middle-aged men are taken up with these young women and they can be very, very charming initially. And then you find that the control comes in when the woman comes into her own skin and yes. wants to do things in a different manner. Mm -hmm. so I know I'm taking up a lot. I'm going to stop now. I'm a clinical psychologist for those who don't know. So I take this from a psychological perspective. Thanks. Okay. Dr. Pottinger, we are blessed to have you here with us this evening, and thank you for that insight. Okay, Doc, sure. I'm not sure if Dr. Reverend Daly has something he wanted to add. If not, I'll ask Ms. Phillips. She had her hand up to... Uh, no, I, no, I said that, that the school system needs to embrace this. So... Um, I'd lo love to be added to the list of people who... All right, so I think right. let us go with Ms. Phillips and then Dr. Baker. I, I had spoken, I had spoken, but there's a quick one to add to this, um, yes. to say that the big issue of power and the yes. imbalance between women and men, which the church has been very uncomfortable with, the inequalities of power, which the faith-based organizations do perpetuate, is also a huge underlying problem. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, may I go before you? Sure. I've been trying to speak. Yes. Thank you. I um, just want to um, extend something that um, Reverend Dilly said about men. I, am, I totally believe that one of the, the strategies is to empower women. As an organization, that's our tool. We empower women and our girls to come into their own as Althea shared. And that is really where a part of the break come from. But I want us to address this issue that we have the excuse of this toxic masculinity mm -hmm. and that men can't help themselves and um, men um, are by nature violent and that kind of stuff. And what this does is that it actually justifies and sometimes renders, um, give men excuses and, and groups of men get together and they say it's a man thing. But it's really is not. These are issues where the individual, the human male must be engaged to take responsibility for ending what he is doing. Um, these are, these are behaviors that are learned and culturally nurtured and you know, have, have um, values, issues mixed up in it. So I, I, I think if we don't address that part, the woman who gets empowered and leave, really does leave a space for the next woman that goes to end up with this man who thinks that this is what he's supposed to do. So we must address this thing that we can no longer allow men to feel that because they are born with a male organ, then they are supposed to do these things. I remember one man said to me, as long as the woman in his house, he's supposed to beat her because that was an expectation. So we will empower women. Um, we will really help them to take back their space, take back their rights, but we must remove the excuse from this so-called toxic masculinity. Men can transform themselves and we must insist on putting the programs in place for them to take responsibility. So I just wanted to share that part of um, my story of how I see it. Joy, I want to, to because I, I agree with you um, that, that we can't, you know, I get nervous every time we talk about how we raise our boys and so on and so forth and women must empower themselves. I, I agree that those both of those statements are true but at the, alongside that we have to address the question and that's why my my i made the comment that you can't have reconciliation without justice so if in yeah, okay the church may feel you know pastors and whatever may feel that they're not um honoring their mandate if they don't seek to keep the marriage going but you cannot, it is, it, is, it is ungodly, it is immoral to send a woman who is being abused and not just physically, emotionally, and in other ways back into the arms of her abuser. That abuser must be called out and must demonstrate 
I don't, I'm not interested in the I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm interested in demonstrating that you are going to participate in whatever program is necessary to get you to deal with your attitudes, with your beliefs, all of these things before even the idea of reconciliation can come about. And there may be reconciliation, but there may not be reunification in terms of the two parties living under the same roof. And, and I think that that is the challenge for the churches. They are so dedicated to you know, the institution of marriage, etc. And I, I, I commend the Mother's Union for putting on this panel, but I would love the Mother's Union to talk about, and among themselves, what is this marriage that we are upholding? Because that's part of their, their code. What is it that we're upholding? Because we cannot uphold marriages which are characterized by violence. So for me, and that, that's really critical, that we, the men have to be addressed on this matter. The other, one little thing I wanted to say um, is that there is a very big elephant in a cupboard in a church, and that is clergy wives. Clergy wives, women married to male pastors, clergy persons. There is a lot of abuse going on. Speak it, my dear. And it is not being addressed at all. To it's the being addressed, you know. Yes, a particular it church is being it is being addressed, actually. And a, a very, very, very little clergy wife yeah. came. She was in obviously in such distress, um, and so on. And the only people who even acknowledged her existence out in the car park, which is where she was, were us, the visitors, the mem and I had to ask, and it, the members of that particular church knew her, knew who she was. They stepped past her. And to make matters worse, okay, she finally got out of the abuse. I don't know what about her mental health, and they are divorced, nothing has been done about that clergy person, that clergyman who has yes. remarried. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, you're, you're right, Peter, and that it is an issue. And I, I think more and more churches are, are beginning to take it on and to deal with it in a very Maybe it's private, <laughs> but I know, I know that it, um, it is, and 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 are beginning to appreciate the necessity of being in constructive solidarity with a woman, and because most of them, that's what it is. I also need my um I I about three months ago, I helped a wife leave a home, um leave a marriage, um using the same principle here it was so abusive and um i helped her leave um i i got i got the police i i, I put everything behind it to help her to leave a, a, an abusive relationship in which she had lost her sense of work and, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, and sense and sense of personhood i i i, I believe that 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 we must not facilitate the sinful self-indulgence of anyone in any marriage. I don't believe we should facilitate it either in counseling or in theology. I believe that sometimes marriage dies. And when it dies, we have to find a way to help people to, to deal with death. But I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm, Reverend Daly. Very abusive marriage. And there was a child, and I and I helped that woman to end that relationship. Then and, and helped them to work through the courts. And I can't. I, I wish I could show you her letter of appreciation. Now I am relating to the man. I don't believe they should ever go back together because of what has happened. Mm -hmm. Yes, Reverend Daly, but she has left the relationship, and you have helped her to leave the relationship. 
there are many scars that I know that woman is still carrying, right? There are many scars that she's still carrying on the outside. And like, um, I think it was Patricia saying, whoever the psychologist on, you have to continue your treatment. I do. There are days when I feel like I would give up, still go through days like that. And yeah. when days go like that, I pick up the phone and I call Patrice Charles and I said, Patrice, so and so and so is happening or whatever, because it takes a long time to heal. Yes, it's true. You know, so so we have to understand that persons are still fragile. We are still fragile, right? And it is very important that our support around us, the persons who support us. And we need to understand that we take solace as we are enwrapped in that situation because it keeps us buoyed, right? And, and you have to understand that as women, we are our worst. We tear down one another. We share with some with another woman and it's all over the place. And people are saying this and people are castigating you or whatever it is. As women, we need to start loving each other. We need to be more supportive of each other. And that is something that within the framework of the Mother's Union yes, in the yes. Anglican Church, there is something that we need to find that space where we can be and we can empty our souls and feel good about emptying, emptying our souls. And five years ago, this discussion this would not have been taking place. I am very encouraged. I think we are we are we are on our way. Um, there's more, more things to be done, but I am very encouraged by this taking place. By what I'm hearing, um, 25 years ago, this discussion in my mind would not have been taking place. I remember when I came out with my story in the Gleaner, there were people who wrote to the Gleaner and who said that because my career is over, I'm trying to seek attention and whatever. But I was really genuinely saying to women, you can move on in spite of all the things that have happened around you. And, and as a voice, I don't think my voice has been used enough because we are such a superficial society. We have all these gender this and gender that and whatever it is, but hitting the nail on the head and exposing it for what it is because it is festering and it really, it is it's gonna end up smelling one of these days and it's gonna be very, very sad for us as a society. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry. Should I be? <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be a part of the solution, Miss Leng. And we really, you know, it has been a moving more than an hour, almost an hour and a half together. And I am really privileged, I feel good that we could all be together this afternoon. We have had esteemed panelists. We have had experience. We have had persons in the audience who are advocates and doing mammoth work out there for gender affairs and ending gender-based violence. And we have been given our mandate as a church, as a mother's union, as a people, and we, can only continue the conversation. We will call on all of you here with experience to help guide our path and to help take part in whatever we task that we seek to do as we move ahead. So we're gonna invite Miss Raquel Walters, Mrs. Walters, to give the vote of thanks. Good night, the panelists. Good night, Good night Mrs. Shadow. You have been doing a great job moderate, moderating. Miss, Mrs. Crawford, when you, you, you started out, you told us that if not, if not us, then who will do it? The charge to the church. And that is a big charge because we need to take a stand somewhere along the line. We need to put our foot and say, okay, this needs to end. We need to get together and get this thing sorted out because our ladies are hurting, our men are hurting. Miss Alja Lang, you came with a true to life story, right? That many ladies can relate to because when you're being abused is only as Reverend, Rev, 
as Reverend said, just the abuser knows exactly what he or she is going through. Nobody else knows. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> Miss Dr. Dr. Peter and Baker, you came from a, another angle. Let us understand exactly what abuse is. Because sometimes we might be walking on the road, somebody calls to us, we think that's, that's nice. But no, we, we are being abused. And we don't understand it until the gentleman rushes over to us and holds our hand and says, you know, see how you may I talk to? Right? Mm -hmm. That is how serious it is. Right? Mr. Daly, I, we will take your charge in saying that only the abuse can stop the abuser. And mm -hmm. that is so true. Mm -hmm. The abuser can stop the abuse, can stop the abuser. Because if we keep going back to the abuse, then the person thinks it's okay, it's correct. You know, I have this person in a corner. So that means that, okay, I can manipulate him or I can manipulate her. And the next thing you hear, the 10 o'clock news, the person mm. dies, right? And at that point in time, if the person that had only just reached out to somebody, doesn't really matter if John or Mary Jane are gonna talk your business, just reach out and say, I am being abused. So only the abuser can stop the abuse. We want to thank you all tonight because this has been a mouthful, you know. I listened and I've learned, you know, and it helped me and my fellow Modigena members to reach out to other persons because at least we can identify now when somebody's being abused too. Because sometimes persons are being abused and they're afraid to say something to somebody else. But because we are now educated, we can reach out and, and give comforting, give a listening ear. And as Alta says, shut your mouth, just listen. Because most of us ladies, we talk too much too. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks again. On behalf of the Mother's Union, St. Mark's Anglican Church, thanks again. We appreciate it a lot. And this will not stop here. We will carry on the mantle. Thanks for having us. St. Mark's um, Mother's Union for on. persons. And I, I don't let too much time elapse. Not at all. Um, you know, it, it to, before you have a conversation about where next, and I, I know the diocesan president is, was in the session. Yes, she was. I really think it is urgent and important. I'm still in. Um, Carmen, Pat. Yes, ma'am. I just put a number in the, in the um, chat. There are crisis numbers that a meeting like this cannot end without people knowing and making sure you're having your phone. I'm not seeing it. Oh. All right. So the number is to call 876-553-0372. And I'm going to put another number. And there's one. Go, ahead. As well. Go ahead again. 8 876-553-0372. And then the, then the main one for then the other 952-9533, that's the women's, the only shelter operating now, um, the Women's that. Woman Inc. Nine five. There's a new, there's a new set shelter, isn't there, that I saw opened with it's lovely space or whatever. Yeah, oh, okay. it's not it's functional yet, no. Uh -uh. I, I blessed the one that was renovated um, uh, uh, several months ago. I don't mm -hmm. think this one is functional yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I let me put in the number. And I don't know if Sonia has any number for over in Barbados. Because uh, no, ab abuse is I not don't ab abuse don't, I don't, don't abuse don't, don't discriminate. It has abuse. no frontiers. It has no frontiers. Thanks, thank, thank yeah. you, Altia. No frontiers. So I put in the other number there now. Mm -hmm. Nine five two. These numbers should be in your phone, ladies. I get calls all the time and I have to run to my fridge door. So put it on your fridge door to call your phone can pop down. Five five three zero three seven two. And nine eight seven. Nine nine goes before everything. So yes. I'm looking forward to hearing from the Mother's Union. Yes, Dr. Baker. There are people okay. affiliated with other denominations, other churches. So I really I think we have to, we can't wait on the either government or church, the institutional church to take this on. <clears throat> a couple of women, few women start education and begin to make it known that I'm available. I will treat what you have to say in complete confidence. And I will walk with you until you are at the stage that you can leave. 
and be oh, just for thank you peter i'm sorry for this um interrupting I was just saying that we just put in the information in there for Barbados in terms of the uh, crisis outline uh, for the, just in case uh, it is needed. That all in Barbados, Miss? The signs? Yes, that's all for Barbados. Yes, yes. so we, we have come numbers for Barbados. Well. And then what we can do too is ensure that those of us who are available for Barbados we can also give our numbers. So if somebody wants to talk late at night, I don't have no man in my bed, they can call and we can talk. <laughs> you know? Okay, so same here. <laughs> and now even if you have one man, you put in your, you put in your, in your thing in your ears, man. You put in the headset, man. Yeah, but we have to be there because when you need to talk to somebody, when that happens, it's, it's crazy. I'm sure. Thank you so much, Althea. I think I'm going to call on you for Women's Media Watch. We're calling yes. on you. You have my number, man. It's there. You yeah, man. Right. Call me. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mrs. Cheddar. Thank you so much. And I see you in church on Sunday morning. We are looking for you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're looking back. for you. I'm coming we're back to my Anglican church. Really yeah. nice. We have I work for it. you to do. <laughs> Come on, I'm ready. Raquel, Raquel, we'll see to that. Yes, we will. <laughs> yes, All I right, will. Good night, everyone. Good night. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so Reverend much. Thanks, thank you Blessing for having this. This, this, is, this is that powerful. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So the Holy Spirit working, Sonia, all over. Good night all, thanks for another enlightening session. Um, Sonia and I have some work to do. <laughs> good night all. Good night. All right, good brother night. for being here. One hand can't clap, we need them on them too. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I, as I was sharing with Elna today, I, I am I'm somewhat sheltered. I grew up in a home with all women, so I don't know anything about abuse, unfortunately. Well, fortunately. Fortunately. <laughs> so um, these things are are really an eye opener, and I, I'll, I'll declare this now um, from the session on the twenty sixth. I have, if you can see me, that I've got gray hair, so I'm I'm over sixty. I've been an icon for that time, and in terms of spousal abuse in the clergy, um, my head is still growing because I probably was not close enough to any clergy spouse to know of this. And at my church, we've had a number of clergy pass through there over the years. And I think all of them except one was married. And that was like, I'm being, I was shocked to hear this, and, and from what I'm hearing over these two sessions, it seemed to be prevalent, but um, it's unfortunate, but something has to be done to support these wives, spouses who are going through this. It's not in silence because you are speaking about it, but um, it was an eye-opener for me, and, and, and um, I, I'm hurt that this is actually happening in our, in our churches. Good night. And Carmen, Thursdays in Black. Do you know Thursdays in Black? You have to make sure you know about Thursdays in Black. And Mrs. Spencer Jarrett? I see your hand up. I'm not sure. If yes, my hand was up. <laughs> it's not too late. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. My hand was up, but I wanted to have said thank you very much for organizing this session this conversation and to thank all the presenters it was very powerful oh, okay. and we know they have been talking about the mother's union but for the past couple of years we have been trying to do something during this time and in march when we have international women's day based on this and one in particular in my group when i was pre branch president before i became the assistant president we started a support group for abused mothers 
and a Bruce, and we have been, that is still going with about five persons in Old Harbor. And uh, I really want us to continue this conversation because it's something I strongly believe in. And I've been using the, me the Women's Media Watch a good while because for the past 10 years, I attended the session at the United Nations. Thank you. Working with this group. So I really feel passionate about this. I, my head is swelling, Sister Paulette. I'm happy that you took it on. And there are other branches I want to come up with something like this. I have another year to go as president, and I hope that we'll have more mileage going out and moving forward. Thank you all for your participation. I feel good that the Mother's Union is doing something. Congrats to our new branch president, Ms. Novlin Ricketts. Oh, she's a new branch president. Yes. Congrats. Why didn't you tell me congrats? <laughs> congrats, Novlin. I'm happy for you. I told you. Yes. I told you. Yes, she has hit the ground running. <laughs> yes, and thank you, Reverend Vaughn. Reverend Hilda Vaughn. Reverend Hilda, yes, Reverend. Yeah. I know she's behind it also. So, Sister Paulette, yeah, Sister Novlin, yeah. and Reverend Hilda, and all the presenters. And the new executive, we have Miss Raquel Walters and Miss Alison Nickel. Okay, you tell and me about them on Saturday. After our meeting on Saturday. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm very happy. So you can take on the other position I have for you then. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a joy to be part of this session. I'm, I'm speaking from Saint Lucia. Hi, Pat. We meet oh, again. Also, hi. <laughs> but um, I would like to encourage um, at some future time, not too far away, that we have the men's group in our Anglican churches take this conversation as well. Um, it would be good to hear more male voices because um, we want to bring, keep the family together, not in um, this rare, but the family unites. Perhaps we can begin to make some serious inroads um, at, at eradicating the scourge from our society. So perhaps at some other, on some other occasion, we can have a sponsored program by the men's groups in, in our churches. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that, that, that's a good twist to it because they need the role models. The young males need the role models. You yeah, know, ladies, yeah. ladies, this is happening. You know, that's my that's my concern because of the place from where I stand. I know yeah. that these things are happening, but they're not connected, and the communication okay. is there because we have had um, when Women's Media what did something on human trafficking and abuse. It was the men's group at Saint Mary the Virgin that invited us. So okay. the things are happening, but the connection isn't happening, which is why I'm saying we need yeah. to a way yes. to approach yes. it from the institutional point of view the peace right, peace right. Thing, thing is not working yeah 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 yes. thank you so much so proud of you all right, Bye. <laughs>